I'm a Prifysgol Bangor and Gant Pedwar Deg Oed Lenny. So I'm really privileged to be the Dementia Studies Lecturer here at an institution that's celebrating 140 years this year. Um, and this institution was created by crowdfunding, as you would call it now, um, by the people who were actually working hard in the quarries um, and on the farms in the community who felt after 400 years since Owen Glyndwr said we need an independence university for Wales, finally they decided to raise the money themselves to buy the hotel down the road. And the hotel down the road was opened 140 years and I was looking at the history recently and I was astounded by what they had on top of the hotel at the procession where they opened the hotel was knowledge is power. So, and the booklet is called Knowledge is Power. I thought Chris used the term first, but obviously it was here in Bangor. It was Kevin Bacon. No, it was the Francis Bacon. <laughs> yeah. But I'm going to claim it for Bangor University today. Um, so I'm going to just give you a quick whiz into the cabin, because the cabin was the name of the, the place where people in the quarries would have their lunch, but also have lots of intellectual debates and competitions. And I think that's a really fitting um, reason why we call our group the Caban, because it's experts by experience sharing their knowledge with students and researchers. I'm not going to play that. So since we've been meeting now for the last eight years, we have really grown the impact that these fantastic group of people have had within the university. We started off really small, um, but now we have 10 health undergraduate sessions every year, which are all led by people with lived experience. Yesterday, we had the first health and social care undergraduate session. Um, and then we have um, masters in dementia, which I'll show pictures of later, which I'm really proud to be the program lead for that. You've got a masters in social work. We've started delivering in there as well. And also you must have heard that there's a school of medicine starting here at the university. We're sharing students with Cardiff now but they've started to have sessions as well. Um, the PhD students have not only consulted, but also been supervised by some of the members of this panel and written chapters in books as well. Um, and also you will have been lucky to receive the latest version of Knowledge is Power in your packs, which has all been created by people living with dementia for people living with dementia. And not only are they really busy in the university here, but they do quite a few other things outside of this arena as well set up their own book, uh, their own groups, um, led by um, Deep United with Aramirianid by Emma, got like-minded by Dory and Jim with his bouncing back groups, which are, are bouncing in numbers as well in Chester. So we started in 2016, where Chris and Jane were sharing their experience on the Panorama programme and also with our master's students, uh, with Sean Williams there. And it's lovely to see master's students here today. They'll come back. So Chris, I can ask um, then we actually were here back in 2017 in an impact award funding that we were sort of trying to promote living with dementia. And that's the whole process of today. We're going to talk about the whole journey of living with dementia from the person who has a diagnosis and their loved ones as well. I'm going to pack all of that in this session. It's going to be quick. Yeah. Then Dory started doing dementia friend sessions in 2017 to our students. And then we went big. We had a big conference in the venue in Sanditno where there were over 200 delegates and we went really ambitious. Poor Yonna had to do all of these workshops for people. We, we never considered the logistical nightmare it was, but it worked. Um, and then we started talking more to the students. Um, what would you want in your learning as undergraduates nursing students? And we had focus groups on our campus in Wrexham and Bangor, and you can see the same faces here have actually continued to work with us. But that really did influence our ability to actually get into the curriculum. 2019, we decided to join the dementia-friendly organization um, momentum. So we decided that the university will work towards becoming that. And one of the crucial things for us is that our members from the Caban group were on the steering group. We weren't talking about people living with dementia, we were working with people living with dementia. And one of the suggestions that came from Glenda was to actually have a, an intergenerational sports day, which has paused a bit, COVID, but we're actually going to um, do that in May. And this is the cabin group in a cabin in the Slate Quarry Museum here. 
So Chris is becoming an honor, honorary fellow. This is the, the Brailsford team having their um, dementia friends and you can see the knowledge is power. I've mentioned a lot of these. Um, and we've actually got master students in Malaysia now who want to copy what we've been doing. Um, and this is the picture from yesterday. So really, really busy group, yeah? <laughs> So before we go on, I want to now ask um, all of our members to just give us a few minutes of their expertise. And I'm going to start with Jane. Um, we're going to start on the process of receiving the diagnosis. Could you tell us a little bit about what that was like for you? So when you notice that there are a few difficulties at home, Chris noticed first his difficulties before I did because dementia is very good at hiding it, especially when you don't know what to look for. Chris noticed that, uh, well, we both noticed that he was becoming a little bit more, shall we say, Victor Meldrew. Um, he, was asking, he was asking if... I thought that was you. <laughs> Where's that hearing aid? <laughs> the special one. Um, so you go to the doctors. Chris has emphysema. You can't see that either. We went to the doctors. We likened it to um, lack of oxygen to the brain, you know getting becoming scatty what I didn't realize was he was getting lost in the car he had all the classic symptoms including not being able to fathom change I had a change jar at home and that was all of a sudden becoming very full very fast because he was using notes and that's a classic symptom he couldn't work out how to use change he just thought he was being a bit lazy or something but actually he couldn't work out the difference between a 50p and a 20p two pound coins one pound coins in fact what were these coins anyway and more recently, since we've had the plastic style notes, he still thinks I'm giving him monopoly money um, because I've always been in charge of the money. But we go to the GP. She refers us to the memory assessment clinic, which is under the mental health um, system of our NHS, um, even though it's an organic uh, condition. Um, and then in November 2012, Chris was... Um, uh, I was going to say prescribed, Chris was diagnosed with vascular dementia and my world fell apart. I didn't know what to do. I couldn't say the word dementia because that was for old people, people that were incontinent in care homes. They had all sorts of all every stigma you could possibly consider was what I thought. And how could this man here have that? So we went home. Chris said, what was it? I said, vascular degeneration. I changed his diagnosis to one that I was more able to say because I was ashamed, I was embarrassed, and I didn't know what to do about it. And then a few months later, he was also diagnosed with Alzheimer's because they went through, because he was so young, they went through every test going, tested him for CJD, that's a mad cow disease. Uh, to those non medical, they tested him uh, for brain. Uh, tumors which I actually prayed I prayed hard not being a religious person for a brain tumor because at least that was operable I had some kind of hope if it was a brain tumor when he got the diagnosis of Alzheimer's gone the floor of our world was gone we went into the consultation room as husband and wife mm -hmm. but we came out of there as patients and carer we were talking um Elena read that beautiful poem about names we now had new labels. I was carer, he was patient, and we didn't know what to do. We'd had our welcome pack book of booklets, um, leaflets, and we went home and didn't know what to do. Rabbit in the headlights is, is too mild a, an expression to show how we were feeling. And we didn't know where to turn. Somebody pres prescribed us, somebody uh, um, organized a social worker to come and see us. I didn't want a social worker because they were going to judge my ability to care for my husband. They might take him away. They might put him in a care home. I'm not unintelligent. I've never been to university, but that's because I found the pub at 17 and the A-levels went by the wayside. You know, um, I'm, I'm a very British, that generation. Um, but the social worker came and my goodness, she unlocked so much for us. She was a godsend, or as I now call it, the goddess send, because she was fantastic. I thought she was there to judge. She was actually there to help. She supported us. She gave us, I don't like the term, but signposting um, and, and enabled us to access help elsewhere. But where, where do you turn when you don't know where to turn? How do you know where to turn? And this is where the idea for the Knowledge is Power booklet came in. 
because the same as any condition you're diagnosed with, if I knew then what I knew now, how much better things would have been. And so being involved with the Caban group, we said, actually, we, we needed something to tell us practical stuff, stuff that nobody else would tell you because they don't think they're more concerned with, do you need an occupational therapist? How's his speech and language? All the allied health professionals, it was all there for us if we needed it. We didn't need it at that time. What we needed was practical help. We needed to know that at some point, Chris was able to get, we were able to get a 25% reduction in our council tax because of his severe mental impairment. At the time of his diagnosis, it wasn't so severe, but as time has moved on, we have known to claim that um, entitlement. We needed to know that there were similar cinema exhibitor association passes. You paid five pounds per year. Chris um, bought this card, which meant he could go to the cinema. He had to pay full price, but I went free with him. Um, and which that's one really exciting thing is that you've got the knowledge is power one and two, but we're actually starting the knowledge is power for carers now. So if you're interested, come and talk to us because we're looking for carers who want to actually contribute to the next one. Thanks, Jane. Because what that will do is all of the stuff we both needed in the beginning is here in the knowledge is power. Most of the stuff, if you think of anything needs adding, please uh, contact CADA. But it gave us very practical tips, things like the radar key, things like Chris could get a bus pass because of his disability, but he can't travel alone. So what use is a bus pass? Well, actually he can have a bus pass plus one because he needs to be accompanied everywhere. So that meant that Chris spent many Saturday afternoons watching the chick flicks, the, 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 the romantic comedies with our 14 year old daughter, buying a subway on the way home, Chris went there with our daughter. They had that time together um, because they could go on the bus. I didn't need to drive him, as we heard from the transport. The person um, with dementia may lose their license. So I became stuck then being the driver. It gave me free time. It actually opened up a different world of possibilities. Thanks, Jane. <laughs> the, the <laughs> and you know what? We could have each one advanced. of these speakers would have a session themselves. And I'm really sorry that we've had to curtail that. But I want to ask Ronnie, because we're, we're going to flip from the, the person who has the diagnosis to the person who's living with dementia to their, their carers throughout this session. So Ronnie, could you tell us how that process of receiving a diagnosis initially was delivered? Because we, we heard from Helena today, and I wrote it down because I thought it was really important. Language frames the way people see the world. Yeah, that's very true. You have negative and you have positive. My diagnosis was given to me and I was told at the age of 49, I had young onset dementia, Alzheimer's. I had two years and I would be in a nursing home. Um, no offer of medication. I was given a carrier bag of leaflets that were in my car till I got rid of it. It was just like, I've been told I've got a terminal diagnosis. Um, and I went away from there. I actually went back to work, um, sat down in my office chair, locked the door and swung round in it thinking this didn't happen. Um, but it destroyed me. Um, I, I was suicidal. It took me well over six months. We went down the private route, had it all done properly, started on medication. And then I met um, Catherine um, at a conference in Llandidno. I was at the point, no photos, crying. Um, Catherine was so gentle with me. <laughs> um, Caban is one of the things that saved me because I worked for North Wales Police for 30 years and then nothing, had to retire. Um, I feel useful again and I'm hoping I'm making change for the future. But the diagnosis that I should have been given was, yes, you have, you know, a terminal illness, you have dementia, but it's not the end. You may not have the life you planned, but you can still live your best life. And I do. I live my best life. Um, my family, my close friends, my faith, my church family, um, walking within limits. I've, I've got respiratory failure as well. Um, coming to, to Caban and I do some work with uh, the Museum of Wales and some other things. 
every day is a good day. I mean, I have to, with dementia, you you see me now and you think, and I'm not, wow, that sounds a bit, but, you know, you sort of, I have to have a down day. I'll need a recovery day tomorrow because my brain will be pickled. Um, but I, I truly live my best life. And when I look now, I think I wouldn't have retired at 49. Otherwise, you know, I'd still be working. I wouldn't, and my children were both under 20. I had so much time with them. I mean, my son and I, when you're told you've got two years until you're in a home, I mean, I was on the aeroplane all the time in those two years. <laughs> it was like, zoom, zoom. Um, but through what we do with Caban, it is actually educating the medical profession because they don't do things out of malice. They truly don't. It, lots of the time they think they're doing it to help or, you know, it's, it's, it's not done in a way. I mean, I think the doctor that diagnosed me, I was just a number. I hadn't seen that doctor before. Um, it was a locum filling in. I mean, she wasn't even going to give me a follow-up appointment. Um, whereas the professor I saw afterwards, you know, he was human. I could talk to him. He gave me hope. He didn't tell me I would lose my license. Am I talking to him? No, because you're, you're, you're really peaking as he gave me hope. <laughs> yeah. yeah? <laughs> and I think that's really important because we've had just in five minutes that emotional roller coaster of being suicidal to having hope. So if you know of anybody, and I know that some people might be living with dementia here or might be supporting a lot of people who would like to give this a go, not just to talk in a conference, but maybe to speak to master students or one-to-one -one with a researcher. It's not something that we do to just, you know, get um, tick, tick a box, because I think it does really make a difference. So next, I'm going to ask Emma. No, sorry. No, it's not Emma. It's Dory. Dory is now going to start us off with the longest section, the middle part. Yes, the longest it is. Section. <laughs> the longest section, not to speak today, but the, after a diagnosis, we hear so often about, this is the diagnosis, think about the end. But what about the middle bit? And what's happening, happening now to you? What are you doing? Oh, I'm involved in so much with Caban. Bangor University, talking to the students. I'm helping with research. So much. But I have Chris and Jane, actually, to thank for that. Because when I was diagnosed, it was just, you've got Alzheimer's. I was 59. They said my life expectancy was five to eight years. No hope at all, just, and by chance, I went to a dementia friend session thinking I might learn something because they don't tell you what symptoms or what challenges may come along. It's just you've got Alzheimer's. And so I went along and there was Chris and Jane. I didn't know them delivering this dementia friend session. And I think I put my hand up and said, I've recently had a diagnosis. And Chris said, well, you look well. And I'll talk to you about that later. <laughs> and we did have a chat. And Chris said, get out there. I've never done public speaking. I was a landscape gardener. I was happy in my wellies, dirty hands. And... But through Chris, I got involved with the Deep Network, Dementia Engagement and Empowerment Project. Got involved with Catherine. I've met so many people and been to so many places that without dementia, I wouldn't have. I could have counted my friends, not even five um i never went outside of flincher and now so i i know you don't wish to have dementia and i know it's progressive but as long as i'm treated with respect and dignity 
you know, I don't worry about that. I've done my power of attorney, my will, my future care plan, and I just live for the day now. And I started, because it was only by chance I met Chris and Jane, I'd hate to think where my life would have gone if I hadn't by chance met him. And so I started, mm -hmm. well, I thought of, it was called Friendly Faces. And Chris came on board as a volunteer and I was a volunteer and Glenda, who was the Welsh speaker. And we had separate phones and the memory clinic said they would give out the phone number. They were fridge magnets because you may not have been ready to speak to somebody, but you put the fridge magnet, you know, one day you decide I'll give that call because not everybody wants to go to groups at the beginning. Um, unfortunately, it didn't get supported by the memory clinic. The leaflets and magnets were all in the corner. So that came to an end. So I started up a group in the pub. And I think, Jim, I sat there every Thursday night at seven o'clock with my glass of wine for nine months. I got a reputation. Yeah. <laughs> she still got it now. Yeah. <laughs> and my son said, you know, because I'd be tired, and he, he'd say, Mom, don't go. Nobody comes. And I said, yeah, but if I don't go, somebody will come that night. And Jim and Carol were the first. And we ended up with quite a big group, but then COVID came, so that all sort of disappeared. So I've now, I've got three groups now. I started one up in Mould, in the Mould Rugby Club. We're not funded by anyone, we're not a service. Um, people just come, doesn't matter about their age, you know, or their stage, really. They come, they enjoy it, we have tea. And, it, and it's so inclusive. How many have you got now? How many groups have you got now? I've got three. Three groups because now. people kept coming and the room got, it just wasn't a comfortable space. There's a saying, isn't there, Dory, about um, build it and they will come. Yes. And, and you have built yes. it. And I think it's such a testimony for you and inspiration for everybody else. You don't need services technically to set mm -hmm. up a group. You don't need permission. And, and you can do it. On the posters, I got some posters printed. And it says, like-minded, for people with dementia, and family, friends, run by people with dementia. We're not a service, we've got no professionals, and that's what they, they say why they come back. But I've got the other side of the story now. I'm going to sneak in a service provider. So thank you, Dory. <laughs> um, but, but with good reason. If you haven't heard the, the name Emma Quake, you're nobody. Yeah. Because Emma is the lady, yeah? So she is an inspirational force of nature. That uh, I'll let her explain what, yeah. what Emma and her team... Do. Sorry, Can I just it. say, yeah. Emma is the exception. Well, <laughs> good. I'm not quite sure how to say that, Dory. Emma is the model. <laughs> So, yeah, you're quite lucky that I'm, uh, I haven't got much time now. I've only got a quick five minutes. Otherwise, you'd all be on your feet doing high-impact aerobics for 10 minutes. Um, yeah, so I actually attended the um, conference that you were talking about in San Didno, and I got to meet these amazing people. And I have to say, they were inspirational um, to me at the time because I was on the verge of doing something for people affected by dementia, but I didn't quite know what. Um, and, you know, eight years down the line, we now have Dementia Active Gwynedd um, in Gwynedd. 
and we have 15, sorry, we have 16 face-to-face -face classes throughout the whole of the county. And we have a couple of online classes as well where we support people to do online exercise and also I support carers um, with a, a regular meeting that we have. So, you know, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's grown and I just want to share with you really a little bit of how it's, it does help people's well-being. It does help people to live that, the best life that they can, you know, it does, it does contribute to that. Um, so, and I think three areas that we, that we see this in and feedback that I get is one, obviously, is the physical improvements that people see through doing exercise. And the second is the, the mental health that, you know, how their mental health is um, improved and obviously the social side of things as well. So if I go back to the physical, I, I constantly get feedback about um, how people feel stronger, how their balance is improved, even though we don't actually do falls prevention, but we do a lot of the exercises that are involved in falls prevention and all the staff are trained at that as well. So um, how they how they feel stronger, how carers see a difference in their loved ones, and how this helps them with their daily activities. It might be just be a simple thing as getting up and down from a chair, you know. And we also have reports from people when their loved ones move to a care home, and they are seated quite a bit of the time there. How quickly that they do deteriorate, unfortunately, you know. But um, the, so the classes we do, they're basically chair based. Um, they're a lot of fun, and Glenda, who is also a member of, of Cavan, and I'm sure a lot of you know Glenda, Glenda always says, we have so much fun, we don't actually realise that we're exercising and that it's, it's good for us. So I think that's great. And then all of that leads to people feeling, um, you know, their moods lifted. And what we find a lot of people saying is that they get motivated. It's something that they really enjoy going to. They get motivated, so they 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 they're happy to leave the house. Whereas before, people had sort of got got isolated, become a little bit lonely. So they really enjoy it. Um, they they gain in confidence as well. And I was speaking to a gentleman last week who has young onset dementia, and he's just lost all his confidence in going out and and just being part of his usual social social circle. But by coming to the group, he's kind of gone, okay, I'm all right here. This is this is good. This is fine. I'm going to go to the pub on Friday. I'm going to meet my friends. So, you know, just helping somebody take that step forward, I think, is, is huge. Um, and then um, the social side of things. Well, this is something that when I started it all, I didn't quite realize the impact that it that the, the social side of it has on people. Um, you know, the, the welcome that not just the staff give to new members, but it's the, the rest of the group. People become, and I've heard it say said quite a bit, people feel as if they're part of a family. And when you feel part of a family, you feel, you know, you feel secure, don't you? You feel happy. You feel, yeah, a sense of, of, of belonging. Um, and I have to share with you one of the events that we do. So on a monthly basis now, we have a botcher league. Do, now, do you all know what botch is? It's like indoor bowls. It's been devised. It's, it's actually a Paralympic sport. Um, and, it, and it's a great sport because everybody can do it. And, and anybody can be good. Anybody can be rubbish. It's really good. So on a monthly basis in Port Maddock, we have a league. And we have up to 24, sometimes 25 teams to take part. So what I love about this is it's not just people affected by dementia there. We have people with learning disabilities. We have people who are part of the Stroke Association. We have Headway. We have people who have done cardiac rehab. All sorts of different people come and, and play. And for the two hours that they're in that hall playing, there's no disabilities. There's no illness. There's no discrimination. It's just everybody having fun, supporting each other, and just having the best time, you know? Um, so that's that's something that we're really quite proud of and and uh, and happy. So, yeah, I think I think um, that's my five minutes, isn't it? Thank you, Emma. And and I think we're, we're sort of really lucky that you're going to help us as a university have this intergenerational sports day because it's going to be yeah. lots of fun having the students and the local children and the people who are members of your groups come to one space and have fun. So thank you, Emma, for all you do. I'm going to ask next for Jim to tell us a little bit about. Um, when you started going out talking through um, with the Alzheimer's Society, um, what's been your journey in five minutes? 
Yeah, right, I'm going to stand up. <laughs> I've been sat here watching the people at the back and you've all been straining your necks to yeah. see who's talking. Yeah. So I thought, well, Thank if you. I stand up, you'll be able to see me and I'll be able to see everybody at the back. Uh, right. My first experience after my dementia, I was diagnosed nine years ago tomorrow. So it's my dementia birthday tomorrow. <laughs> nine years old in my dementia tomorrow. Uh, I lost all confidence in myself for nearly two years. The only people that knew I had dementia was my family. Didn't tell anybody. Then I bumped into a couple of people from the Alzheimer's Society. Uh, I felt as though I was in a big, big black hole and I couldn't get out of it. They actually helped me climb out of it. Uh, we need that. Oh, oh yeah, okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, one of the first places I went to when I first was getting better over my dementia, living with it, was with a lady called Jo Lane from the Alzheimer's Society. She was so inspirational, it was just unbelievable. Uh, and she said to me one day, would you like to come to Bangor University with me tomorrow? So I said, yeah, okay. So we came and that was the first day I met Catherine. Uh, I went to watch her doing a dementia friend session to the students. She was making them all dementia friends. So I'm sat at the end of the stage, uh, waiting for her and listening to it and thinking, no, this is really good what she's doing here. Then she finished the session and she said to me, will you go around and give some badges out? So I said, okay. So she gave me a bag of badges and I was walking around giving the badges. And then she'd finished hers and then she gets on the stage and he said, she said, I've got such a surprise for you today. She said, I brought Jim with me and he's going to get up on the stage and talk to you. Well, I could have fell over. I don't know how many people was there, but the hall was full. Uh, I thought, oh, what do we do now? So anyhow, I had to get up and I started talking. And the more I talked, the more I got. And I loved it. Uh, got really involved then. We got involved with Caban. Uh, kept coming up to the university, talking to students. Uh, became a member of DEEP. That was a big help to me. And really, that's what helped me get through all my problems. Then COVID hit us. COVID stopped everything. Terrible. I was living in D-side then. And just before the end of COVID, when they, well, it was in the middle of COVID, they stopped everybody traveling on buses and you couldn't do this, you couldn't do that. And my family lived in Chester. So Carol said to me, we should really try and move back. So we did. We managed to get a place uh, and we moved back to Chester. When I moved to Chester, most of the things I was doing were still around the D-side area. So I phoned the Alzheimer's Society up in London and they put me in touch with somebody, my nearest representative, Chester, would you believe, was Preston. Not just a top skip and a jump away, an hour and a half car ride away. So I said to her what I was looking for, somewhere in my area, for a group for me to go to. Nothing. The nearest one she could find me for me, 25 miles away. So then I think I've got to do something myself. So that was when I started my first group. Very hard to get it going. I think somebody's waving now. They've had me five minutes already. <laughs> uh, but anyhow, it escalated, and What's I've now got him? three groups going. What are they called? Bouncing Back. Yeah. Bouncing <laughs> Back with Dementia. Yeah. And somebody said to me, why did you call it bouncing back, Jim? And I said, well, I thought I was in a deep hole. I said, and I've managed to bounce back. And all you people that come here, it's only open to people living with dementia and the carers. Nobody's allowed to walk in. I've actually physically removed two people from the meeting that wanted to come to talk. And if you don't make an appointment, you can't come. It's as simple as that. The groups are run by the group. If we do anything, the group decide we're doing it. How to the people? Well, exactly. And that's and what it's the, all the about. Letting them do it. I'm going now. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, Jim. <laughs> right. I, because it's a long journey, we've had the beginning, we've had the middle, 
but there is inevitably the end, yeah? And I'm sure lots of you will have seen that the really, um, so really sad, but really important news by Mary Mitchell recently. Um, and I, I do want to include the end in this session as well. And and I, and sorry, Mary, what did, Wendy Mitchell, where did I say, sorry, thank you. Sorry, sorry, not your Mary, <laughs> sorry. Um, so I want to ask, um, what happens next? When you've actually been active in the community, but you're thinking, well, what's next? Um, you know, a lot of people are afraid to talk about care. Chris, what's been your approach to care or care homes? Um, yeah, um, firstly, I think um, we, we went from patient and carer back to husband and, and wife, because not everyone's a good carer. <laughs> And we were much better at being husband and wife because that's how we've always cared for each other. And, and that got me thinking about, you know, people beat themselves up because um, they're not the best carer in the world and, they're and they think they're expected to be. And then I, I started reading about guilt of families promising not to put someone in a care home. And then if they live long enough, they have to go there. And I'm thinking, what's all this about? I thought, I'm not going to put my family through that. I'll go now. And I'll, I'll try before I buy. Jane was horrified, absolutely horrified. Um, I think you cried the few, few times you took me. I loved it. <laughs> it was great. I didn't have to do anything. I got weighted on. I had a complete day off. And that made me think then about all the stigma about care, the misconceptions about nursing homes and also about what people with dementia can do or not do, as you've heard today. Um, and um, I found one which was beautiful. You weren't allowed to make a mess and you weren't allowed to go outside. And Wi-Fi, well, you can sit outside the manager's office. You might get it. But you couldn't because the door was locked to the manager's office. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so anyway, not 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 the best is always the best. So um, I really encourage people to try before you buy, and if you're living on your own, it's a wonderful place because you're not isolated anymore. It's great for everyone. Oh, I found another one now. Yeah. 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 Sorry, I'm forgetting lots of things now. And someone said, "How are you?" And I said, "Progressing quite nicely, thank you." And, and they went, oh, brilliant. <laughs> but I did beat my all-time record today. I woke up again. <laughs> um, yes, and I chose this other one because it overlooks the sea. It's a fantastic view. I can sit there and time can just disappear, which I love. I don't have to worry about anything. That You can go out in the garden. They, they were having... Um, um, they're having competitions to grow sunflowers. And the manager says, but something's going on. She says, someone's coming out and swapping the names around. <laughs> and, and that reminds you again that, that people, no matter what the stage, they, they have dementia. They're not stupid, you know. And, and, and when you're given a life-changing diagnosis, you have to change your life. And a lot of people try and cling on to the old one. And you can't do that because it will make you depressed and sad. And you can't isolate yourself either. Um, it's easier to isolate yourself, but if you, because you haven't got obstacles or hurdles, you know, and you think I'm not going to make a fool of myself, but if you do that, you progress far quicker, far quicker. It's about being busy. I can't remember exactly what I've been up to, <laughs> but but I've been up to quite a bit, I think. But um, and that's down to my PA. <laughs> Another label. <laughs> So, so um, um, yeah, yeah, and, and a care home should be a change of address, not, not a change of lifestyle. You should be able to do exactly the same things you've always done. And we need to encourage people to get over the stigma of care in nursing homes. We only hear about the bad places. Let's hear more about the good places. There's far more good places than bad places. Did you choose that one? Oh. Oh, yes. And, and, and the biggest reason I chose this one, apart from the views and the lovely garden, 
Um, did you do a sherry morning on the Wednesday? <laughs> <laughs> and that Thanks. sort of threw it for me. Thank you, Chris. So any care homes online or here want to think about the marketing strategy, have Wi-Fi, have sherry mornings. Yeah. Now, thank you, Chris. Yep. And and I think, you know, we, we were talking when we were planning this session and it really struck me when Chris said, actually, I'm in a better place now than I was earlier. Uh, and I think that that's, you know, it's important to remember, but it is a very emotional period for everybody. And Mary, I really appreciate Mary coming to talk today because Mary's going to tell us about what happened when Mike was diagnosed, but also later on what happened. So, you know, it's about the process and the reality of caring as well. Thank Interesting, you. The audit has come out. Come out, yeah, that's important. Perhaps. Thank you, Mary. Yes, well, um, when Mike was diagnosed, we told everybody um, that was the way we wanted to do it. Um, our family, obviously, close friends, church members, all the support groups we're in. Um, we had a very active life. Um, we enjoyed walking, choir, ukulele group, church activities, volunteering, family and friends, grandchildren. And we continued to do that for quite some time. Eventually, though, I mean, for Mike, he didn't go gently into that night. Um, he was sectioned and taken to the memory hospital. Um, I visited every day. Um, it was one of the <laughs> most heartbreaking things I've experienced, meeting him um, with his things packed, ready to come home each time. Gradually got sorted um, and he went to um, a care home um, nearby um, and we continued to go out to places of interest and do as much and to, and to the groups we enjoyed in church and singing and music um, we did all sorts of things in the home I met their very inspirational lady who can't be here today Pam who heads up Mirrily Mon in Hollyhead um, I, I, who taught me so much about how to be um, with, with Mike um, so we, we kept going there and uh, things broke down with there. He didn't like having his personal care done. Um, he, I would quite often, so I would go in every day and help to do that. He would quite often, I would get hurt uh, in the struggle. Um, I mean, it was still a very loving relationship. I bought a bigger bed so that we could uh, have a cuddle. We had a city put in there in the room because we wanted to be together. Um, but and we're still going out. But uh, the other side, it, it's it's a game of two halves. You know, we were enjoying life out and going to. He was coming with me to play with the ukulele group in a teepee and, and near the beach. Um, but then he had diarrhea, and uh, this is what I call poobageddon because I I, I, I was not uh, uh, equipped to deal. And the 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 beach, the toilets at the beach were. Off. I didn't know whether to go to the ladies or the men's and uh, and the more I tried to sort him out the worse it got and I, my language was rife that day and um, it was very very distressing in the end um, home was nearer than care home so I took him home and we got showered and that sort of thing so there's a you know I can tell you all the lovely things that we did but uh, the other side of that coin is the 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 anguish the exhaustion uh, of um, of caring the 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 grief of the person you love most in the world um, disappearing before your very eyes. Um, from things broke down at the care home, it went back for 24 hours to the hospital and then was sectioned and taken to the adult psychiatric unit at the hospital, which is, you know, the staff were very, very kind, but it's the worst possible place anybody could be who has dementia. Um, it was totally destimulated. We couldn't go out anymore. We couldn't do anything. There was nothing to do. Everything was... Um, stationary and tied down and removed um I, I am stressing though the staff were very kind but once he was in there we couldn't couldn't get him out they everybody agreed he shouldn't be there couldn't couldn't get him out um so eventually after a lot of uh suggestions that he might go to Staffordshire to a care home or to somewhere else um and I totally refused eventually whether it's prayer or whatever he, he got to somewhere fairly nearby um, on the mainland. We, we live on Ang Anglesey. Um, so he he went there. Um, 
And I was I, I tried so hard to to uh, not be friend to, to make wherever Mike was a home from home. And it, it it doesn't it can't possibly be that. But as much as you possibly can, I did. Um, I would visit every day. I got to know the staff really, really well, uh, so that they knew me. They knew what Mike was about, what his story was, and who he who he was, and his interest, and all that sort of thing. Um, but then six weeks after um, admitted to this particular care home, it was locked down. So one day I visited him, and the next day I couldn't. Um, and I have to say also, all the way through the journey, there's a lot of guilt involved because it, um, I grew in patience, but I'm not the most patient of people. And there was a lot of frustration. And then then the guilt kicks in and you, and you, you punish yourself for not being more patient and not being a nicer person and promising. This wasn't part of our retirement plan. We, we retired to Anglesey um, after working very, very hard um, in our own independent school and nursery. Um, and it wasn't part of the plan, and I was so cross with it. Um, and then I became very cross with the lockdown and COVID because uh, it it took him his last year months. Um, we were parted. Um, I could have um, video calls, and I could eventually meet him outside, and couldn't go in his room. Couldn't go in his room until uh, he was bedridden, and um, at the end of his life. And I was very angry that those those months, those last months together, were were just taken away from us. And you know, the frustration of knowing that I was seeing absolutely nobody at home. I was on my own, seeing nobody. And I, I sort of said, "So why can't I? You know, I'm no risk to him." Um, but they wouldn't set a precedence. And I know they were following government guideline. Um, in comparison, you know, the care staff, lovely people, very, very conscientious, were going home to family. <laughs> and it just didn't make sense. Anyway, um, I won't dwell on that. But um, so, yeah, I, uh, all the way through that, I tried to um, just maintain my res resilience and well being and Mike's while we were together. It was a joint effort. Um, you know, when he just before he left home, my home, which is our home, which was a safe place, had always been a safe place, became a prison because he he wasn't coping well, and so my life was shrinking. And so I have to say that I I hear you talking about lacking in confidence, but I lost mine. I lost myself because my focus was my husband, and um, I, I I didn't know who I was because I, I, that's all I, he was all I thought about. Um, and how to make his life um, have some have a, a quality in it, and so you know you, they talk about living grief, but um, and I thought well, I've, I've done all my grieving, but it was nothing. I'm really sorry to say this. It was nothing in comparison with actual the bereaved grief and and having to. It was a, just changed. It was different, um, and it's you know he passed away in twenty one. And, you know, I, my interests are still the same. I still got, you know, lots of friends, lots of interests. I, I love my life, but finding myself and my confidence after years of losing it, you can't get it back in this uh, snap of a finger, you know. Um, and it's an ongoing journey, as is coping with that loss. Um, but I have to say, at the end of the day, um, my main aim is to to find the joy in the small things uh, and the glimmers in the small things while being aware that probably I was very fortunate because I know of uh, friends who are um, in the small carers group that we have at the moment that were supported through the years are exhausted and struggling. I know of people in their 80s who, who aren't getting the support that they should have, who have got comorbidities, who can't cope, who, who aren't getting a lot of quality and pleasure out of life and th that's the disparity between you know what what's happening at the moment there are good things and then there are awful things <laughs> and I think um, that's but I'm, yeah. I'm concentrating on the good so I don't want to depress anybody <laughs> I think it's really important because we heard about you know digital exclusion might there might be people at home who can't join online today 
can come today. And I really appreciate Mary and everybody else on the panel for sharing so openly and so bravely. So I'm going to ask everybody to just hear what their tips of well-being are. Okay, so everybody's tips written down here. I'll see if I can find everyone now. Okay, so my, if, if I can be as cheeky to say my tip for well-being is trying to walk up a mountain. We've got plenty here and I've been looking at them for 50 years. So it's time I actually got to the top of a few. Um, so Chris, his tips for well-being was coming out, not hiding away or being embarrassed, learning to ask for assistance and help. Finding as much information about dementia so it helps me to live better, share this with others and help them understand better. Ronnie, time with family and friends, my faith and church, family and Kaban group, being able to walk and lots of holidays. Dory, being outside, doing what I want, not being stopped from doing things. It's the way people treat me. It's a message for us all, I think. Jim, doing things. Yeah, being with people. Um, and I think that this has come through with a lot of the talks today, isn't it? Jane, it's been able to go away in our motorhome where for the most part, dementia doesn't exist for now. That's lovely. Um, Emma has got a whole list of things, <laughs> which you could understand, which includes yoga, walking, Pilates, swimming, but being outside. For a small part of the day. And I did feel guilty pulling you all back inside in the break because that's Emma's well-being tip. Yeah. Mary, what would be your well-being tip for us? That because yeah. I'm saying I can't remember what I said. Obviously, didn't say anything. But um, you, you do, do so many different activities. So yesterday well, I, I when we saw I, you, you'd been to the ukulele group. The, the uh, a cappella group? Yes. Oh yeah, yes. Yeah. So I sing in a ladies' barbershop choir and a community choir. I play in a ukulele group. I'm in a small group that um, of soloists who go around singing. Um, I'm also a member of Tide, which I forgot to mention, which is Together in Dementia Every Day, which is um, a, a charity set up for uh, unpaid carers um, to uh, raise uh, awareness and um, I can't cut strategies yeah. to to help people and unpaid the. That the whole life of an unpaid carrot helps them to to um, lift their voice and raise their voice and yeah. speak out. And yeah. I, and I suppose that's helped us to get to meet you as yeah. well. Yeah. So I'd like to thank everybody for everything that they do, not just today, but every other day of the week as well. Yeah. So if you're, oh, sorry, sorry, I'm always typing up. <laughs> my happy place is my allotment, which direct payments pay the yearly fee for my allotment. And I've called it lost the plot, but <laughs> but that's my happy place. Yeah. And yesterday we went to the healing garden. I think that's a lot of work there, isn't there? In, in Bangor. Yes, yeah. lots We of won't work. go there. So please thank our fantastic panel. There we go. I'm going to make a quick plug here. Not everybody gets offered direct payments. And I know the law says we are supposed to be offered that. I'm still hearing stories that where people ask for it, they're not, that, that they're refused. Never mind, they should be being offered it in the first instance. So please do what you can to allow us to access the entitlements, benefits and rights that are there in legislation for us, for all of us here, because we can't do it without all of you. So please. Yeah. And next, Chris and Jane. <laughs> Sorry. It was Chris and Jane that told me about direct payments without them. Or read the knowledge is power, yes. which is in your bags. Yes. 